everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today, the General Availability of MariaDB Column Store 1.0. My name is Amy Krishna Mohan, Director of Product Marketing at MariaDB. Today's speaker is myself and VP of Engineering, David Thompson. We are going to walk you through the overview, architecture, and key features of MariaDB Column Store. Before we get started, let me go through a couple of logistics. If you have any questions, please submit your questions during the webinar. We'll have a Q&A session at the end. And if you'd like to tweet about this event, please use the hashtag MariaDB and hashtag column store. All right, uh, next slide, please. Before we get started and learn about the exciting features of Column Store, let me give you a quick overview of MariaDB. MariaDB is the fastest growing open source database. Started by founders of MySQL, MariaDB Corporation is reinventing database to support today's enterprise needs. From OLTP to analytics, from a single SQL compliant interface. The key requirements that drive adoption of MariaDB products are the modern and unique architecture, which is extensible at every layer, so users at the community can extend functionality to meet unique needs. And industry-leading security trusted by toughest industries like banking and government. And finally, the world-class support from the founders of MariaDB and MySQL. Next slide, please. MariaDB's growth is accelerated by 12 million users in 45 countries who not only run mission-critical applications, but also continuously innovate and actively contribute new technology to MariaDB project. Next slide, please. Additionally, MariaDB is a default database to major Linux distributions like Red Hat, Ubuntu, and is available through major cloud providers like Amazon AWS. Our new part of vision for the company is to radically simplify the adoption and consumption of database. We will provide flexible deployment options for on-prem cloud, which can cover various use, use cases, whether it is transactional focused or analytical focused. We also make our database, we also make sure that our database is de developer friendly by supporting various languages and frameworks. MariaDB products include the widely adopted open source MariaDB server, and complementary products, including MariaDB MaxScale, MariaDB Column Store, that are valuable for deploying MariaDB in large mission critical applications. MariaDB is built on modern architecture that is extensible at every layer, whether it is client, cluster, or kernel, or storage. This extensibility provides two major advantages. First, it allows for continual community innovations via plugins, which means that the variety of, variety of storage engines like MariaDB Column Store can be integrated through MariaDB extensible architecture. Additionally, it makes it easy for customers to configure MariaDB to support a wide variety of use cases from OLTP to OLAP. Our open source community is actually very different from other typical open source community, where the quarter is focused on opening up the code. MariaDB community innovates together with the MariaDB Foundation and Corporation. Whenever we find a valuable innovation from the community, we incorporate those innovations back to our source code so that we grow and innovate together with our community. As you can see, our product includes contributions from the leading companies who are solving the, one of the most challenging problems like scalability, key management, and encryption.
So this is a quote from Gartner. The data and analytics leaders should augment IT-centric reporting based platforms with modern platforms that improve business value and speed time to insight. Analytics is no longer focused on reporting and dashboard. It really needs to bring the business value for the decision makers. So now David Thompson, VP of Engineering, will introduce MariaDB Column Store 1.0 and walk through the exciting features of MariaDB Column Store. David? Thank you, Amy. Um, so yeah, so we are um, kind of being pleased to announce that we had our GA release of uh, Column Store last week, and today we're going to walk through a high-level view of how Column Store works, the architecture, and then also a short demo to show you how easy, it's, how easy it is to get started with Column Store. <clears throat> so first, we're just trying to um, lay, lay the groundwork for why we think Column Store is um, uh, a great product in the market today. So traditionally, data warehouse, data warehouse platforms have been a great solution, but they come with a high high license and hardware cost. Meanwhile, Hadoop-based solutions deliver cost-effective storage, but they really only focus on offline processing. Column Store can provide a real-time analytical view of big data to a, wide, to a wider audience of data scientists familiar with, familiar with SQL. So during the beta, during the beta product, um, one, of, one of our beta customers was a company called Pinger, and um, they they um, had a really successful beta program, and um, you know one, one of the quotes um, that came out of Aziz, our contact there, was that MariaDB Column Store is the future of data warehousing. And so for him, um, you know, why, why is he saying that? So for him, what we solved was they had a data mart running on a row-based um, MariaDB server, and they really just swapped out the storage engine for Column Store and they really solved all their scale problems and now they can store a lot more data there. <clears throat> so within the MariaDB ecosystem, um, this is just sort of like a guideline for where we sort of see where you should use OLTP and where you should use Column Store. So Column Store is really better suited to higher volumes of data. It's not to say it doesn't work with smaller amounts of data, but you're maybe not going to see quite as much gains. And so really it's designed to support up to petabytes and trillions of rows. So MariaDB Column Store brings support for high-performance distributed columnar storage to support a wide variety of SQL-based analytical use cases. Column Store has better price performance compared to other commercial data warehousing options. It provides easy access to enterprise analytics by providing a single interface for both transactional and analytical workloads. Finally, it helps you process analytical queries faster and more efficiently by using parallel query processing and other features. Let me explain each feature in more detail. So here we see a high level architectural overview of Column Store. And users interact with Column Store through the MariaDB SQL front end. Connectivity is provided through the standard set of MariaDB connectors, um, such as JDBC or ODBC, allowing your existing applications and tools to easily, easily integrate. The MariaDB SQL front end, sometimes referred to as the user module in Column Store, provides the entry point for queries and orchestrates actual query execution. Queries are optimized into a series of primitive data steps which are sent, sent to the distributed query engine nodes for execution. A distributed query engine instance, sometimes referred to as a performance module, performs the set of data operations for its set of data returning intermediate results back to the user module. Filtering joins and aggregations are types of primitive data steps that are pushed down to the PM level. The distributed query engine can utilize a wide variety of storage options from local disk to network attached storage, including SAN, Gluster, and EBS and AWS. Column Store is designed for scalability. Both the UM as well as the PM can support horizontal scaling. So as your query volume grows, you can add a new UM node to provide support for a greater number of concurrent queries. As your data grows, you can add new PM nodes. The performance of the system scales linearly as new PM nodes are added, i.e. if you start with one PM and you add another, for the same data set, the performance will double as the work is now distributed between the two PMs. 
Further, within a PM, all cores of the server will be, will be utilized to parallelize each operation. The PMs follow the principle of shared nothing architecture. Thus, during runtime, each PM is working in its own unique data set, allowing maximum parallelism during query processing. This also means that a new node can be added while queries are running with no downtime. <coughs> now, let's, now let us look at what columnar storage really means. Hold on. Um, I'm going to note that the uh, slides are not moving. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, let's let's look at what columnar storage really means. Traditional row-oriented databases store the data sequentially as rows, as you can see here on the top. To execute a query such as the example given, it must scan each row to produce a result reading columns such as four and they're not, not even referenced by the query. If there's no index in the state column, then the entire table and all columns must be scanned to produce the results. With a columnar database, each column is stored as, a, as separate files, as you can see in the bottom here. Now the query engine only needs to scan the state, the state column for a match and then project the F name column for the result. With very large data sets, this makes a large difference in performance. Now we'll dive more into the architecture starting, starting at the storage level. Column store storage architecture is designed to reduce disk I.O. during query execution and to minimize operational maintenance effort. By storing each column in a separate file, this provides vertical partitioning. This happens automatically as an outcome of just creating your table when you uh, when you, when you design your database. Further, a column store automatically partitions data logically every 8 million rows for each column file into an extent. This again is automatically maintained by the system, including tracking minimum and maximum values for that extent. This metadata is distributed amongst the nodes and is used to optimize query execution to reduce I.O. and processing. With both of these schemes, there is no need to maintain or manage indexes, as each column is essentially an index. Finally, data with an extent is also compressed. In many cases, individual columns have many repeating values which compress particularly well. <clears throat> this helps reduce storage as well as reduce the cost of reading the data. Ongoing DDL is also relatively simple since adding and removing columns can be done online with no impact to concurrent queries since we're just adding a new file or removing a file. Next, I'll cover data loading. Column Store provides a very high-speed parallelized data loader called CP Import. This interacts directly with each of the PM nodes for maximum parallelism and performance. Multiple tables can also be loaded in parallel. Queries can execute concurrently with data loads. This is achieved through loading new data above a high watermark across all columns. Queries will continue to access the data below the high watermark until the operation completes. After that, then the data the, the, the new data will be visible to queries. Column Store also supports read committed transactional updates via DML and load data in file from the MariaDB server. However, these are not quite as fast as CP import. <coughs> if you want to support newer real time updates, um, CP import can be used at a very high frequency, loading micro batches every minute, for example. Now let's cover how query execution flows through the system. The query is received by the MariaDB server. The column store engine then transforms the query into a job, which is a set of, of primitive data operations. The extent map is utilized to form this and discover which PM nodes are needed to execute the query. After the results are returned from the PM nodes, any final result, result sorting and select list functions are performed before returning the result set to the client. The PM nodes do not understand SQL. The supported defines set of primitive data operations such as restrict, project, group by, and aggregate. Let's take the example of a restrict operation. <coughs> Each primitive data operation will be assigned to operate on a, on a few hundred blocks of data for a single column within a given PM server. The data blocks are read from local cache or disk, and then the operation will be formed using multiple threads to take advantage of multi-core multi servers. In this case, the job step will, will perform the required operation against each column value to produce the final result, which will be returned to the, to the UM server. Each primitive operation takes a fraction of a second. 
and the system allows for fine tuning of the size of the job queue. And also to prioritize queries to optimize for real world concurrent workloads. <coughs> so drilling a little bit more into uh, query processing and how we use the extent map concept. Column store vertically partitions data by storing each data in separate block storage. The data is also logically horizontally partitioned for each 8 million rows, which is known as, as an extent. So here on the slide you can see that we have, <coughs> we have three extents. Um, we're using the same example from before. Um, let's say that we have a 24 million row table here. So part of the metadata that we maintain in the extent map is to track the minimum and maximum values for, for each column. So if we take a look at the, the state column, with extent 1, the minimum state value is CA or California, and the maximum state value is New York. For extent 2, it's OR to what to WY, and for extent 3, it's IA to TN. Note that there is some overlap in the ranges in here. So let's take the example of the query we, we saw before. So select, select first name from table where state equals New York. So what's going to happen is that <laughs> we're going to use the extent map. And since we know that the where clause condition is state equals New York, we can see that, that it could be an extent one, but it's not going to be extent two. So we're, just, so we're just, we're not even going to bother looking at that extent. It could also be an extent three because it falls within that range. So now what we're going to do is <coughs> the execution will be passed down to the PMs that hold these two extents. So let's say that there's, these are these are on it's a two-node system and these are on two different nodes. <coughs> so the operation to scan state will be passed down to PM1 and it will scan and look for all the rows that have value New York. And the same will happen on node PM2. Once we've identified the state rows that match, there's a separate second operation which basically projects the columns in the first name column from the columns in the state column. These rows are then passed back to the, uh, to, the to, to the UM and then they're joined and then returned back to the user. Column store provides a rich set of analytics capability, including distributing complex joins, aggregations, and window functions. <coughs> On this slide, we just kind of show a typical example of type of window function that is supported by column store. So in this case, what this is doing is, is showing you a running average of, of um, item sales within a web catalog. Extensibility is provided for by utilizing user-defined functions. And column store can also support querying tables from other storage engines with a capability called cross-engine joins. This allows you to support, say, storing dimension tables using InnoDB and the larger fact table using column store. Any tool or framework capable of using ODBC, JDBC, or any other MirrorDB connector will work with column store utilizing standard SQL. <coughs> with the MirrorDB server front end, column store provides the same enterprise grade security features including SSL for data and motion security, role-based user access control, and query history for security audits. Column Store can be deployed on-premise using commodity Linux servers or in the cloud. For AWS, we have an optimized AMI. Column Store can be deployed with high availability in mind, providing automated, automated failover across both the UM and PM nodes. Distributed storage such as SAN, Gluster, or EBS is required to support PM node failover. Okay, so next I'm going to do a short demo, just basically to, ease, to show you how easy it is to get started with column store. In the demo, I'm going to use, utilize publicly available data from the US-based peer-to-peer lending company, Lending Club, and use column store to answer some questions on the data. <clears throat> so first, um, I'm just going to quickly show you how easy it is to find and download column store. So, You'll see that we're on, in my browser, we're at the MariaDB.com website. So we click the download button. 
and then we click Cotton Store. Here you can see, um, here you can go ahead and download um, the version of whatever works for, for you. So we have uh, Debian, Red Hat CentOS, and Ubuntu Builds. If you have um, another um, distribution, um, should work, um, so we'd recommend that you probably want to build that from source. Okay, so I'm just going to switch from my browser. So here, here you'll see um, we have a, a Linux server, and I've already um, set this up and downloaded this, downloaded the Com Store RPMs. This is a CentOS 7 um, VM. So you see we have the RPMs here. So I'm going to go ahead and install these using Yum. So this will install um, MariaDB server, the storage engine, and some of the backend backend components of, of Column Store. After this, um, we will run a configuration script that helps us set up and configure configure Column Store. So you'll see, um, as even just the RPM I put included a little helpful tip that this is what we need to run next. So we're going to run this post configure script, and this is a guided installer. So the first question it asks us if we want to do a single server or multi-server install. Since we're just getting started and want to keep the demo simple, we're going to do a single server install on the current server. <coughs> going to accept the default system name. Um, I'm going to use internal storage here since I'm just using a single server. And then it asks me about um, assigning a range of DB routes. So, in a single server install, you're probably just going to want one here. Typically, we would create a DB root per server, but you might want to create more per server if, say, you had um, multiple storage arrays. <laughs> so now it's going to start on the installation. You'll see here I put, I put in some information um, about these configuration settings. So what this means is these are actually configuration settings within Column Store. NumBlocks percent is basically the percentage of memory it's going to utilize for, for block caching. And total UM memory is the percentage of memory it's going to, it's going to reserve for, for UM operations such as you know, final result collation and sorting. <laughs> so you can see it's now kind of um, set up MySQL um, and now it's working on starting up, starting up column store. If we were to, if we were to have done a multi-node install, um, the installer would have asked us information about the other nodes, and it would also automate the installation on those nodes. So you either either have to provide a password or set up SSH keys to support that. Once this is once this is started, um, I will show you just do a quick a quick example of the admin utility. Okay, there it goes. Um, recommends I create these aliases so I can use things like um, MCS admin as an alias. So I'm going to do that now. So just going to do a quick check to make sure that the system is really up. So I'm going to call MCS admin get system status. <laughs> that I put two rows, one for the system saying it's active, and then one for module PM, which is active. So everything looks good. If we had a multi-node install, we'd have um, a number a number of additional lines here for each node. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to um, the data. So I'm going to switch to my uh, demo directory, and the first thing I'm going to do is just kind of quickly show you the SQL for um, the column store table here. So pretty standard stuff. We're going to create a database and then uh, create the table loan stats. So you can see lots of um, standard data types. And then just one slight difference here, we have engine equals column store. The other thing you see is you don't see a lot of constraints or indexes, since column store doesn't really need to support those. So 
gonna gonna create that table and database. So that's done. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna load the data. So I have um, the, or the data already downloaded from Lending Club, and um, I have it as a compressed file here, a compressed CSV file. So let me just show you that quickly so you can kind of get a sense of what that looks like. <coughs> so basically just a standard CSV file um, with basically, you know, lots of columns and lots of rows. Um, column store does require that you don't have the first column name row in your file, but that's pretty much it. This file uncompressed is about 900 meg and there's probably about 130 million column values in it. So next thing we're going to do is to import that. So created just a simple wrapper script just to <coughs> avoid a lot of typing. So in this case what we're going to do is you can kind of see here's the CP import call. We have um, optional mode parameter of minus M1. What this says is that if we had a multi-node deployment, the system will distribute the data across nodes. There is an option to run CP import on each node individually as well. And then there's just a couple of configuration parameters to, to indicate how it should read the file. So here minus S says separator is comma, and then minus E says the values are surrounded by double quotes. We put the database name and then the table name. Um, if we weren't using command line redirection, we would put the file name after this. But um, I want to save a little bit on disk. Um, and also, by compressing the CSV file, it actually makes the process go a little bit faster because it's obviously faster to read a 200 odd meg file than a 900 meg file. So we're going to run this now. <laughs> So as I mentioned earlier, the way that CP Import is working is it's really working directly with the PM servers and directly with the write engine within the PM server. So that's how it really gets um, very fast speed. So internally, it is using uh, multi-threading to multi-thread reads and parsing of the file and also writing of the file. The data is also written above the high watermark so that um, reads so that queries can continue to function and they won't see the data until the import is complete. So you can see that completed in a little bit under 30 seconds and we had about 1.2 million rows. So that's pretty cool. All right, so next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create um, a couple of dimension tables. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to create those using InnoDB just so we can kind of show cross-engine joins working. So I've got a script here. Let's go create these. So, first thing I do is I create a, a states dimension table, and then we're going to use um, load data in file to load that from a CSV file. <coughs> and then we're going to create a time, time dimension table basically from the fact table data. So, I'm going to run that. is a shell script. So you can see that the uh, that completed, so just scroll up a little bit, so you can kind of see that the uh, states D table was created, engine NODB, we did a load data in file, and then we just did a simple um, <coughs> create table as select to um, create a simple time dimension table. Now, we do have to do a little bit of um, setup to enable cross-engine joins, so I'm going to have to run a script for that. So this script is basically calling the set config program within column store, and that allows us to update um, some of the system configuration. In a multi-node setup, um, you could run this on your PM1 node, and the system automatically replicates it to other nodes. So I'm going to run that. It takes just a second. So at this point, we basically have all our data loaded. We've loaded our, our big uh, low and stats fact table, created a couple of dimension tables, and we've enabled cross-engine joins. <coughs> so next, I'm going to 
run a couple of queries. So the first query, um, I will just show this, is a sort of relatively straightforward aggregation query. <laughs> and so what this query is going to do is um, look at the data since um, from starting year uh, 2014 and basically do a quarterly report um, with the sum average and count um, of loan amount. And um, if we run this, we'll see we'll see the data. So what you'll see here is that you know their business is growing um, really pretty well quarter over quarter. But you start to see a dip in the uh, second quarter of this year. That corresponds to uh, kind of a problem that company had where they uh, issued some, some loans that didn't meet their underwriting practices and the CEO ultimately resigned. So you can kind of see that really impacted their growth. Um, if you look at the average loan amount, you can kind of see that that didn't really change all that much. And the count, the count more or less matches the total loan amount. So one of the things I also did in the script is <clears throat> we enabled query trace. So that is done by just calling the call set trace function within your session. So here we did select call set trace one. So that, that enabled query trace so that we can kind of dump out some information afterwards about how the query executed. We do that with the call get trace function. And so this output, um, this outputs four rows. So basically, this kind of shows you sort of a high-level summary of the, the, the steps went through to execute the query. So the first row, it says CES. What this basically means is it did a cross-engine join to go query, go, query the, go query the time dimension table and get the results where t dot year is greater than 2014. The next thing it did is um, a set of batch primitive steps, and this executed on the PM. Here it also shows that it only actually referenced two columns. So again, this is an area where column store gets great, great advantage over a row-based system. The next line, HGS, stands for hash join. And this, so what the system has done is it pushed down the results from the dimension table here to the PM, and it's doing a hash join against those columns here. Finally, uh, we see a TAS step on the UM. What this basically means is that it is the, the user module accumulating the, result, the aggregation results from the PM. So the aggregation, the actual aggregation group by an aggregation calculations are, are happening on the PM. But <clears throat> sometimes there's additional processing to pull together the results. So this kind of gives you a sense of, of what's going on in the query and also kind of like the elapsed time and also the number of rows that are um, being referenced in each step. So that can be used to kind of help tune the system. Next we're going to show a more complex query utilizing in window functions. So I'm going to take a look at that one. So here, um, <coughs> this query is basically going to report on the top ranked delinquent loan amounts for the five Pacific states. So what you'll see here is we have the loan ID, the address state, the interest rate, the delinquency amount, and then we have the window function to rank, rank that row relative to the other results. We have a partition clause which basically says rank that with an address state and then order it by delinquency amount descending. We also just do it. We also do a join against the states dimension table, so we can take advantage of a convenience column on that table to to, <laughs> to identify the Pacific states. Finally, we do a, a filter on the results to only show the top three. So we're going to run that query now. So 
So we take a look at the results here. Um, so you'll see <coughs> there's the five Pacific states. We also see the individual loan IDs, and we, also, we see the interest rates and the delinquency amounts. So we take a look at Alaska. Um, you'll see there's one, two, three, you know, a fairly high one, then a low one, then a very low one. For both California and Washington, this kind of illustrates the behavior of the rank function when you have a tie. So if you see like the highest, highest delinquency amount in California was 70K, but there are a significant number of, of them that were 65K. So the rank function is going to show you those, but since there are now more than three results, it's not going to show you a third row. If we want to show the third row, we can use the dense rank function. If we want to just show exactly three, we could use the row number function. Something that's interesting here is that, you know, there's not necessarily a correlation between higher interest rate and the delinquency amount. So here we have a 9.9% interest rate, but we also have a 22% interest rate. <coughs> Again, um, run the trace function. Um, really the only thing that's kind of different from the last query, or significantly different from the last query, is now we have this WFS, which is the window function application. Here you can also see there's a much higher number of rows, about uh, 200k rows. So next, um, just want to show you a quick demo, um, just to kind of show you that um, column store will work out of the box um, with you know tools that you have in existence today. So a little bit earlier, um, I set up um, <coughs> set up Tableau and connected to a column store instance with, uh, with the same data. So here, kind of showing the same data um, with uh, different visualizations. So at the top, we have the loan amount kind of broken down by year, quarter, and month. And then we're also showing um, the bars based on the loan grade. So you can sort of see there's, you know, generally a higher number of the higher grades and a lower number of the lower grades, which is kind of what you would expect. If you look at the average delinquency amount, you can see that, interestingly, there's a lot, you know, in some, some months there's actually a fairly high number of Gs that are under delinquent, which maybe is not unexpected. So let's say that, um, just to kind of do a quick change, let's say we wanted to change this last payment amount to be, um, change the measure to be a sum. So you can see that went pretty fast. So now, now, we, now we see a graph based, rather than the average, we see a graph of the total, total monthly payments by, by month. So that um, ends my demo. So I'm going to switch back to the slides. Go back to presenter mode. <laughs> so, in summary, Column Store has better price performance compared to other commercial data warehousing options. It provides easy access to enterprise analytics by providing a single interface for both transactional and analytical workloads. And finally, it processes analytical queries faster and more efficiently using par parallel query processing and other features. I hope I've inspired you to learn more and try out MariaDB Column Store. Here you can find links to download the GA version, view the source code and documentation, and learn more from our learn more from some of our recent blogs. Thanks for your time today. We'll now cover any questions that you might have. Sure. Okay. Thanks, David. Uh, so we will do the Q and A session now. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to submit your question in the questions uh, box. So we have a lot of questions submitted. First one is, do we have any Docker image for column store? Yes, we actually, um, if you search our knowledge base, um, we have an initial single server Docker image or Docker file for column store. Um, we're also working on <coughs> the necessary steps to support a multi-node deployment as well. All right. So
So next question is uh, how is data replicated across PM servers? So data is, so column store itself is not really responsible for that. So when data is loaded in a multi-node system, CP import is going to spread the data out um, equally across nodes, basically in about 10k chunks. <clears throat> if, um, if say you had a PM node go down, um, to support automated failover, we require that you have some sort of distributed storage. So whether that's network attached storage, EBS, or Gluster. Um, so we, we believe that there's lots of great storage sub, sub, subsystems out there that provide for, for storage replication to other nodes. And so Column Store doesn't try to solve that problem. Okay. All right. And next question is what compression ratio can be achieved using Column Store? So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to vary widely on your data, um, but, you know, we've seen compression ratios up to about 10x, you know, may, maybe 3 to 5x is more realistic. So, you know, if you have, typically you're going to see a lot of repeating, like, dimension or lookup values, and those columns will compress very well. Um, the algorithm that we use is we use an algorithm called Snappy, and that sort of trades off Perform, runtime performance for good enough compression. So we don't necessarily try to get the best compression. Okay. Um, can you explain what type of UDF you provide in the column store? <coughs> well, we support um, mm -hmm. the same syntax as MariaDB's um, server does. So. Okay. And the uh, next question is, what happens if you lose a PM when queries are running? If, um, if, a, if, if you lost a PM during a query execution, then that query would fail, and as a client, you would need to retry it. Next question is, uh, we are using partitions as a way to separate data in different way. Uh, how this can be achieved in column store? Um, I would need to understand the question a little bit more, but maybe I yeah, can kind of explain can... partition, <coughs> partitioning a little bit. I, I can try to explain what, how column store does, does, does horizontal partitioning. So, one one of our goals with Column Store has been to make it a very easy to maintain and operate system. So, by design, the system is performing this automated logical partitioning. So, mm -hmm. one of the trade-offs of that is that you don't you don't really directly influence the partitioning scheme in the same way that you might do in a you know traditional database. Um, you do semi influence it. Uh, based on the ordering of data that you import. Okay. All right, the next question is, uh, can we keep dimension replicated and fact distributed? Yes, right. yes, so if, if you, if you, I think I understand the question. So, <laughs> how you would achieve that is that the you would create your fact table as a column store table, and so you would get the distribution that way. Um, if you wanted to rep, uh, if you wanted to replicate the dimension tables, then create those as NODB tables. Um, if you if you set up a a multi UM node installation, the the installation sets up a default installation of uh, replication. So the NODB tables and, and then also the column store table definitions get replicated to the other UM nodes. Okay. Right. Next question is, can you insert using the MariaDB interface and does it support updates or, or do I have to only use the bulk loading? No, you can, you can utilize, you can use, you can utilize DML and that's fully transactional. Um, the, the only real trade-off you have there is that 
column store and most columnar systems are more op are, are more optimized towards bulk inserts. So individual inserts will be maybe slightly slower than you might expect, say, in InnoDB. Um, but if you do, say, uh, an insert select, then that will be pretty fast. The reason for that is that um, the system is optimized towards writing whole blocks rather than in individual rows. You can also use the load data in file syntax within uh, MariaDB server as well. So if next question, if a single PM node is down, do queries still complete? So if if a single PM node is down and there is no automated replication, then the queries will likely fail. I think if the data can be fulfilled from the other nodes, it will work. Um, that's why we recommend that if 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 uptime and high availability is important that you set it up um, using external network storage because that way <clears throat> the system will detect that a node is down and it will assign another node to basically temporarily um, support the data that was on the failed node. And so basically it does that by essentially either you know, mounting that data on that second node or if you're using something like Gluster, um, it could it, maybe that maybe that data is already replicated there. Mm -hmm. And if I think we'll take two more questions. Uh, so this one is: Will individual inserts affect the select performance too? No. So the um, individual inserts will are also um, written to what is called a version buffer. So that also allows us to maintain uh, read commit. Um, semantics. That's true for update and delete, obviously. Got it. All right, so the last question is that do you support AWS or OpenStack for column store? So for AWS, um, yes, we, we, have a, we have an optimized um, <coughs> AMI um, available, and that's set up such that it will um, support um, more easily adding a node within the AWS ecosystem. So it will provision an instance and then also set up um, EBS correctly for you so you get failover. Um, we don't have optimized solutions for other cloud providers yet, but um, you know, um, there's no reason why it won't work. Um, I mean, we in our own testing, we use both um, AWS and also a, uh, a managed cloud provider um, that provides us um, raw servers and both work great. You got it. All right. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so this will conclude our webinar today. Uh, recordings and the slide will be sent to the email that you register for this webinar. Thanks again for joining our webinar today. Uh, have a nice day, everyone.